Hello and welcome to this episode of the World's Best Coaches podcast, the series where we go around the world and interview the best of the best when it comes to coaching and consulting. Today I am joined by Andrew Stern from Andrew Stern Coaching. Andrew, I'm just going to give you a second to introduce yourself, kind of let people know what you do and what space you're in at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, Sam. I am fortunate to work as an executive coach with the next generation of exceptional organizational leaders. Many times they do not as yet have a C-level title. They usually report into C-level leaders. And within the next few years, they will likely take that mantle in their own right. Uh, this is a, a business that I've been fortunate to build over the past several years and continues to, to grow today across different industries, as well as within different functional disciplines within companies. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So I'm intrigued. Why did you step into the space of coaching? You know, was that always the plan? Oh, gosh. I don't know that any of us have a, a fully mapped out plan, Sam. I don't know that this podcast was even planned a few months ago, right? <laughs> so this, you know, what I what I would say, if we rewind the tape here, I was very fortunate um, prior to launching my own firm of working at two really special companies, Squarespace, the online presence platform, and prior to that, Bloomberg, the financial information, media sort of powerhouse, um, both of which are known around the world. And at Bloomberg, I was fortunate to be certified as an executive coach and to lead the company's investments across the Americas in executive coaching. At Squarespace, I had a global remit. And in both places, I did a lot of coaching on the inside of those organizations. To your question, though, what, what sort of was the impetus for going off on my own and starting this business? It was an observation that I kept having, a reflection that kept popping into my mind across those two organizations, which is there's a lot of energy in the executive coaching world at the very top for yeah. those C-level leaders. There are so many respected, admirable executive coaches serving that population. And in my experience also, Sam, there's a lot of individuals at what could be described as the lower hierarchical levels. They are serving individuals that, let's say, are high-performing individual contributors, or they are first-time people managers. There are so many great virtual coaching platforms that make coaching incredibly scalable for that cohort and digestible from a company's perspective, from a price point. And if you put these two things together, you find this sort of middle ground, this notion of a murky middle that I did not observe to be sufficiently served. And so I said, you know what? enough of looking for these platforms. Let's go build one. Let's go serve this middle group myself. And I've been fortunate to do that with my own practice, but also partner with some great organizations and individuals that share a similar aim of serving that particular murky middle sort of cohort that is pushing upward in their leadership journey. Yeah, I saw that you had a lot of ties with uh, quite a few kind of coaching firms and that uh, kind of thing. Tell me, what, how was the transition initially going from, you know, an employee, I guess, into the space of running your own business? Right. I mean, it, it is a very steep learning curve, to put it simply. Um, a position, you know, working for an organization where a paycheck is deposited every two weeks or every month, whatever cadence, uh, to starting from zero each and every day each and every week, each and every month and quarter, and needing to deliver tremendous value to different individuals and organizations along the way. That is a fundamental shift. Um, you, you are very much in the driver's seat. It is very much your, your ability to earn a livelihood, generate you know, financial success, is a connection to the work that you are doing day in and day out. It is not something more passive that just sort of lands in your account regardless of your performance within a company or whether you took a week or two vacation. It is much different, no doubt. I was fortunate that this business had gotten some legs under it prior to leaving Squarespace. I began to work with individuals at companies like CBRE and Major League Baseball and the Department of Justice prior to stepping out onto my own. And so I had a bit of a running start. And the pivot that you're alluding to, again, different coaches will have different perspectives on this. My sort of inclination, my starting position is to have these kinds of affiliations or these relationships, these partnerships with other coaching firms that may be in a position to help me supplement my own business development activities and put me forward for opportunities I may have never even known about or 
been considered for, but are within reach for them and their organizations just because of the relationships that they have with certain HR leaders. So for me at this stage, it's a sort of two-part approach. No doubt I am you know, pursuing opportunities on my own, but there are other instances where opportunities come my way through some of these relationships that I've been fortunate to cultivate and platforms I'm lucky to be a part of. Great, great. And have you ever done any kind of pro bono, like do you give back in that way? Do you do any free coaching in, in that sense? Mm. You know, there no doubt are instances where I show up for especially friends of mine in what could be described as a pro bono kind of capacity. In other cases, it's for dramatically lower rates than what organizations may be paying. Uh, this notion of a friends and family kind of a rate package that still acknowledges that it is hours of my time, but it is also within reach for somebody paying out of pocket mm -hmm. relative to what a company may be paying from their coffers. I think the the great opportunity that we have with coaching, if we sort of think about the future here, is that, yes, there are formal certifications. Yes, there are great credentials that I've been fortunate to uh, earn and add to my sort of CV resume, my background, no doubt. And coaching is, it's also, it's a mindset. It's, it's a way of being, it's, it's a way of operating and navigating, going about our world. Yeah. And if we, if we open ourselves to the possibility of being a little bit more curious or a little bit more introspective or a little bit more reflective, coaching, we, we all have the capacity to show up in this way for people that we care about. Um, and that, you know, is one of the, the great lessons, I suppose, from Michael Bungay Steiner um, and so many other coaching thought leaders. If we can just be a little bit more inquisitive or a little bit more reflective, a little bit more curious, reserved hold back our sort of natural tendencies of offering advice or solutions. If we can just stay curious a little bit longer, the world might be a much better place. No, I completely agree. And the, the beauty about this world that we're in, and I, I believe that, you know, entrepreneurialism is, it's, it's sometimes rare, but the, I mean, they don't teach enough of it in school, um, really. But, you know, there's an unlimited, not an unlimited, but there is always people coming through with new ideas, new businesses that are going to need that support. And thank God we have people like yourself that are there to stand by and give accountability and help in that sense. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, that is one of the, the great things about going off on my own is uh, I've begun to work with individuals, not just within more established or mature organizations, but also there's a client I'm working with who's a founder and CEO of a new venture in the venture capital space, investing yep. in Israeli businesses, as an example. So there are so many individuals that we have the capacity as coaches to support. And our job ultimately is to meet the coachee where they are yeah. and attempt to provide the greatest value to the journey that they're on. This is meant to be scaffolding, something that goes up and it comes down. It is temporary. It's not forever. Um, and if we are really doing our jobs as coaches, we have to meet the coachee where they're at, the challenges that they face, the limiting beliefs that they hold, and they need to be the ones driving the bus and setting the next steps after each of our sessions. Exactly, exactly. So in the UK, we have a, quite a, I wouldn't say it's common, but there is a lot of misconceptions around the idea of business coaching, because a lot of business owners, they're closed off, you know, they, their business is their baby. And the idea of having someone come in and look at that, look at the financials, look at the plans, look at everything, they, yeah, that's a scary prospect, you know. Have you come across any kind of these misconceptions in the US and in your start of coaching? Yeah, no question. I think uh, you alluded to one of them, which is squarely around openness. And yeah. I think, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to study under Marshall Goldsmith, who many regard as one of the greatest executive coaches in the world. Um, you know, Marshall tapped me along with about 15 other folks um, in a program in 2022 to sort of cultivate the next generation of great coaches around the world. And so we got to spend a lot of time with him and folks in his network. He said, if we, uh, just to back to your question here, one of the greatest and most important choices that a coach will make is who they will actually work with, the clients that they will take on. Yeah. And if a client is not open to these kinds of conversations, it doesn't make sense for anybody. And no. if, if that's the case, if an individual is in that starting position, then now is not the right time. Or certainly, at least for me, now is not the right time for me to be working with you. I was on a chemistry call with a prospective client a few weeks ago where this came up. And it was apparent that this individual was being forced to do this and was not actually open to the kinds of introspection and reflection. 
doesn't make sense. Let's pause. I'm not going to be the right person for you. Yeah. The other misconceptions that I would call out, Sam, in my experience, perhaps this is in the U.S., but I suspect it could exist in other regions as well. One is that coaching is purely the delivery of advice that I am dictating to you what you should do, um, almost as though I'm some oracle or some omniscient person who knows every element of you and your business and your preferences. That, that is not the case. I am not dictating or offering advice. Instead, my aspiration is to create space for someone to identify different possibilities. Which one they want to pick is their choice and only theirs to make. And then we try to pressure test it. If we select this, what are the challenges? What might be the hurdles? What could emerge? How would we work through those and so yeah. forth? So it's not advice giving. The other sort of element that, that I would call out from a, uh, a sort of misconception, sometimes individuals will say something like, does coaching have any ROI? Is the investment with you wise from a financial perspective? How do I know that I'm going to get the value that I'm committing to this relationship with you? And in, in my experience, there are so many ways to actually measure the ROI. No doubt there is the opportunity to say, okay, what are the goals of an engagement? And did we meet those? Yes or no. But we can also bring in others' perspectives. An individual, a coachee could identify 360 reviewers that could provide input, feedback, assessments of someone's evolved performance and behavior over the course of an engagement. And therein would be a tremendous amount of data. So all this to say, Sometimes a misconception that is out there is coaching, there's no ROI. How do I know that this is going to be a wise investment? And if ultimately a coach can't offer at least those two dimensions of ROI from a coachee's perspective, but also from the stakeholders that they're working with, yeah. it's probably not the right person for the organization to be working with. No, and I think, you know, there's a common thing where people, they perceive the coaching fee to be a cost and not an investment. And I think that's, it's wise to keep on reminding people that, yeah, we're not a cost. We are, you're in a, we're, you're investing in us to help you fix problems or, you know, right. you know, set the goals that you may not have thought about. So uh, Marshall Goldsmith, like you mentioned, it's the, what got you here won't get you there. It, you know, uh, we had the privilege of working with him. I've met him a couple of times and he, yeah, uh, an amazing, amazing, amazing guy. And it's, yeah, sometimes it's just purely down to, you know, asking the right, you need someone to ask you the right questions, but also you've set this goal here, but why have you not set this goal just a little bit further? Why do you not think that's achievable? Let's look at it this way. It is achievable. It comes down to your daily, daily, weekly, monthly hard work and applying that. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, if you know Marshall, you know that he actually employs somebody. I've never met this person. Uh, this individual calls Marshall each day, wherever he is in the world at the exact same time, yeah. and explores several questions with him. I believe he calls them the daily questions to help him maintain his own accountability to items that he cares about, whether it's connected to himself, his family, his business. Um, and again, we could all take a page out of that playbook that this is hard work. It requires discipline. It requires follow through. And it's for those reasons that enlisting the help of somebody else likely makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when you look at sports, for example, um, when you look at anyone that's a sportsman or a sportswoman, they, you know that they always have a coach. Now, when you look at it in the business world, it's like, well, why wouldn't you have a coach? You know, professionals need coaches. And I think that it's down to accountability, somebody keeping you accountable every week. Yeah. But going back to what we just said, basically, but yeah, absolutely. And listen, Sam, I would go one step farther. If you look at some of those elite sportsmen or sportswomen that you're alluding to, they likely have multiple coaches, yeah. not just one, right? And so if we, if on the flip side, we're just thinking about a small group of people that could be working with either the next generation of leaders or those at the tippy top of their leadership at the C-level organizational leadership, um, these are wise investments from an individual perspective and certainly from a company perspective, when you consider the amount of responsibility that is often connected to some of these seats, the tens, hundreds, or even thousands of people that could be connected to an individual's remit, um, it, it just makes sense. And in the scheme of an individual's total compensation or their department's total budget, it's a drop in the bucket ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. So if I was going to step into the coaching space now, you know, I've 
got some experience. I've decided that that's going to go into my, my passion is that I want to be a business coach. What, what kind of advice would you give me starting that journey? Mm. Well, I think the, the first thing that, that I would call out is the statistic. I, I believe this is a couple of years ago, and I'm not going to get the exact number correct just because it's not in front of me. But I believe somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent, right around there, of executive coaches earn revenue through means other than executive coaching. And right. so to your question of if I'm just starting out, I think the first thing that an individual should be prepared for and perhaps set up some of their own infrastructure around, their own kind of milestones or objectives, goals around, is what else might I do? Acknowledging that I'm not necessarily going to be delivering executive coaching services to clients for, let's say, 10 hours per day every single day. Yeah. What else might I do to diversify my revenue mix? Whether that is, for example, workshops, keynote speeches, a book that someone may be working on or other thought leadership. Perhaps there are other professional pursuits that somebody has totally separate from leadership or talent or organizational development. Yeah. How might I as a coach, if I'm getting started, how do I create a bit of a portfolio of revenue generating possibilities, assuming that 100% of my revenue likely will not, especially at the very beginning, come just from coaching? No, absolutely. You know, define your services. You know, also find your passion. Um, I mean, most coaches have an, a niche. They have an area that they focus on because that's where their experience comes from, and they're passionate about that. I think it's so important to find that quickly. Um, well, don't rush it, obviously, but you know, find that and utilize that as much as you can because people will see when you're passionate about something, and they will believe it more. Not that you need to convince, but you will have to convince sometimes. But yeah, you know what I mean. Absolutely, and the goal ultimately is for a prospective buyer to say, not just when I have a coaching need, I think of Sam or I think of Andrew or whoever might be listening, but even more nuanced. When I think of, let's say, a next gen coaching need, or yeah. when I think of a female executive presence coaching need, or when I think of a male, um, let's say, within financial services coaching need to get more focused in a coach's niche, as you're alluding to over time. The goal is to be top of mind. The goal is to keep yourself, your brand, your reputation top of mind for those prospective buyers. And with each successive client, a brand is fortified and cultivated uh, to ultimately earn that phone call when it does come. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, th this day and age with entrepreneurialism and, and people coming out of school and maybe coming out of college with a degree, you know, they have the entrepreneurial seizure. They want to do it. They want to make that leap. What kind of advice would you give that person that is on that scary doorstep for going into the entrepreneurial world? Mm, no doubt it is scary uh, because the prospect of stepping into no immediate revenue possibilities rev relative to friends of yours that may be, let's say, stepping into full-time employment opportunities with some large, admirable global organizations that, that is daunting and that is scary. I think the, the item that I would just call out that I might even reframe is that at that particular juncture in life, as bizarre as it might be to say aloud or consider or even digest for somebody at this moment in time, it is actually relatively less risky to go out on one's own at that point in time compared to let's say, several years later when an individual may have, let's say a mortgage exactly. or yeah. a spouse or uh, two children or a pet or other things, an aging parent, other things that they may need to take care of and devote yeah. energy to. And so I suppose the item I would just call out is that yes, no doubt it is scary. It is not for the faint of heart. It requires a level of determination and grit, absolutely. And relative to other points in time later in someone's life, it is actually relatively less risky. Um, so maybe there's a bit of a reframe for, for folks to consider. No, I actually completely agree. And that's the first time someone's kind of mentioned that side of it. I hadn't thought about that. And I think that is a really yeah, good point. I think they also need to be aware that it's, you know, if you're not educating yourself daily, weekly and monthly, um, you know, if you're not reading every business book under the sun, you need to be absorbing as much information now as possible. Um, because it will benefit you no matter what down the line. Yeah. No question. I think, you know, obviously 
Um, there's a lot to learn from the teachings of Adam Grant, specifically as a professor. I would just, you know, call out Adam as a really remarkable example of someone who is infusing their reading, continuous learning, the research into their interactions with others. Yeah. And so as we go forward, it's not just to upskill or uplevel ourselves, but it is to arm us with information that we could share, exactly. that we could spread, that ultimately could metastasize in the world, you know, beyond, let's say, the one-on-one -on -one interaction someone may be having. So yes, you're spot on to call out the need for continuous professional development, even beyond the university or college setting. And of course, that takes a lot of different forms. It takes the forms of on-the-job learning, formal education, certainly self-paced learning, but also social learning opportunities through things like mentors, coaches, personal boards of advisors, and the like. Absolutely, yeah. So in terms of your coaching structure, I'm curious, do you follow a pretty set structure with most clients or do you adapt this, you know, with, you know, the, the world is changing, people are learning in different ways, you know, how, how do you adapt that and do you adapt it often? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, there is an adaptation, uh, no question. Uh, not every single coaching engagement that I deliver to every single individual follows the exact same scope of work. That is absolutely the case. It's both based on an individual preference, organizational preference, budget, you know, the actual need that we are working on. So no question, there is some variability. I think the core tenet, or if there are two, if you will, that is really common across all of these interactions that I have. Yep. One are the actual sessions with a coaching client. What, what that looks like would be 30, 45, 60, in some cases, 90 minutes. It, again, varies a little bit based on individual schedules and the like, preferences. But to look at an individual's current landscape with them in a one-on-one -on -one context and to dive deep into it. I, one of my instructors, she used the phrase uh, when we were getting trained on the sort of skills associated with coaching, yeah. she used the phrase playing in the mud. And I just loved that. It really sort of stuck with me. This idea of really immersing oneself in the current state yeah. so that we can identify possibilities coming out of it. So yeah. there's always going to be that one-on-one -on -one work. The other thing that I would call out that is very common, slightly less than the one-on-one -on -one sessions, no doubt, is the 360 work. To this notion of ROI generation, sure, I could have an individual say, I'm getting better. I'm making progress against the goals. I have achieved the mile markers. But it's even better when we have a lot of other cross-functional stakeholders who are coming to the table with similar assessments of, you know, I know Sam's been working with Andrew for some time. At the beginning, I saw X and Y, and now I'm seeing A and B. And then if we fast forward several months later to observe some stickiness with those behaviors, they persisted. It hasn't just stopped after Andrew has stopped working with Sam, but these are new ways of operating, sort of new plateaus that we're observing in someone's leadership. So in addition to those two, no doubt there are psychometric assessments that can be infused. No doubt there are other kind of assessment tools that someone could leverage. There are occasionally are team effectiveness sessions that may get baked in. If I'm working with, let's say, a functional leader and they want to do some work with their leadership team. So there are other facets, including stakeholder conversations with HR or a person's manager, you know, just to make sure that the coaching coalition is all on a shared journey together. Yes, these elements exist, uh, but not every single coaching engagement has all of these for a variety of reasons. I think it's fantastic as well when you come across a business owner that has opened themselves up to coaching one-on-one -on -one with you, for example, and over time they see the value and they start to think, okay, so I want you to speak to X. I need you to speak to X. And it's like, okay, you see that switch in their brain where they're like, everyone should have you or everyone should have someone that's, you know, there. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, this, this can be one potential unlock, this idea of, a leader working with a coach, seeing the value, the resonance, the appeal, the utility, and wanting to make it available to other people. And this is where, again, if someone's starting out in their coaching practice, to be able to tap into a broader network of other coaches that an individual maintains, or a formal affiliation that they have with certain organizations, yeah. uh, that they could sort of say, listen, I've been working with a leader. They have an interest in bringing coaching to their broader team. I am not in a position to coach all of them. I'm probably not a fit 
nor do I necessarily have the bandwidth. Here are some other alternatives that I think highly of that I think could be great matches for the need. That to be able to say, not me, but somebody else is hugely valuable um, as you're getting started and to sort of still serve the, the individual that was initially brought to you, your initial client. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing stuff. So obviously you probably work with goal setting and vision with a lot of your clients initially when you start working with them. But what, what's the plan for you? What's the plan for the business going forward? Ah, yes. So a little goal setting and vision for myself. Yes, no doubt. You know, if phase one of the business was focused on standing up my own client base, my own uh, sort of revenue possibilities. And if phase two was having these other kinds of partnerships and affiliations with great organizations that do work around the world in executive coaching and leadership development, team effectiveness, that might be phase two. Phase three is to say, hey, you know what? There are certain coaches that I've come to know that I would like to spend more time with, that I would like to farm more opportunities to. And perhaps we might form our own coalition. We might form our own sort of network or collective, if you will, to be able to go to market. Um, that, that is sort of phase three. Um, and it's only in its very infant stage at present, the, the earliest formation of those kinds of partnerships or relationships, exploratory conversations. But this idea of, hey, if, if we begin to create a niche and be the sort of go-to for this murky middle audience group, um, this coaching group, um, there, there's a lot of possibilities, a lot of individuals we may be able to serve. And oh, by the way, the bet might be, hey, if we're working with them right now, and if we fast forward several years, some of these individuals will move into the C-level. And some of them will, several years after that, move into board roles and so forth. And to be in individuals' orbit at this critical juncture in their career where they're just stepping up into their first really mission critical leadership seats that that could position us for you know several additional years of partnership and collaboration um and that's really exciting yeah i think that's a really really great idea um you know teaming up and use, utilizing other people's skills and and other coaching techniques because everyone has their own techniques of course and i think yeah being a bit being able to adapt and come to different types of businesses and executives it's it's going to aid you guys so much down the line absolutely yeah let's see it's a hypothesis at this stage and you know so much of entrepreneurship is just that right taking taking a, a sort of learning and seeing is there something here almost like a, a comedian might you know writing a joke sort of saying yeah, yeah. is this is this something is there something here might i make something more of this that other individuals would enjoy too let's see well, look, we're, we're really big on business education here. So my last question to you will be, what is one book that you would get everybody to read in business? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, one that especially for this particular audience group, you know, who's likely yeah. listening to our, our conversation today, um, there is a book by the founder of what is called the 100 Coaches Agency. Um, his name is Scott Osman. He co-wrote this book with Jacqueline Lane and Marshall Goldsmith. It is called Becoming Coachable. And it is all about the skills that individuals need to be in prime position to participate and derive the greatest value from coaching. Now, you might say, Andrew, I, I wasn't asking you about a coaching book. The title's Coachability. Like, that, that's not super helpful for our audience. The third section of the book, Sam, is about this notion of flourishing. And I just think if more business leaders read, that, especially that third section, which is around human, organizational flourishing, the, the possibility of viewing our professional pursuits in a way that could advance humanity and elevate sort of society. There, there's sort of a higher level kind of calling that this third section of the book brings out. And, you know, of course, there's great content related to coaching and coachability, um, certainly helpful for coaches, but also coaches for the broader business community, that third section around human flourishing. Um, I, I actually think it's, it's sort of a novel take and uh, could appeal to some out there. 100% and I hope that everyone goes and checks it out. I've not heard of it myself, so I will also go and have a look. Um, but thank you very much for coming on, Andrew. It's been it's been really great. But where, where can people find you if they'd like to reach out? 
Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm fortunate to, you know, have a, a bit of a presence on LinkedIn and that's the, the best place for individuals to reach out to me directly. Um, and of course, if they prefer Twitter or now X, um, I am also there with the, um, the, the sort of name Andrew, you as an umbrella and Stern, my last name. So folks can reach me on either platform and I'd welcome the chance to be helpful to them or individuals they care about. Nice. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam.